This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. Each plugin, as long as you don't go crazy with it, each one adds its own little bit. Harmonics here and there, tone, and all these little bits just end up adding up to something that sounds great at the end. I rarely do I go crazy with a plugin. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with a unique golden drop capsule design. The Vintage Series V67 and V11 microphones offer Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a rich, warm sound to your studio with crisp clarity and detail that will make you wish that you had discovered these mics a whole lot sooner. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKS star right now to get 50% off their vintage series microphones. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Sarah Carter, a BBC-trained mixing and mastering engineer based in Basingstoke in the UK. Sarah started recording and mixing music in the mid-90s from a small home studio as a hobby, and in 2000, at the somewhat uh, ripe age of 34, she decided to find out how to turn that hobby into a full-time career. She studied at the SAE Institute in London, gaining an audio engineering diploma, and then went on to work for the BBC in London as a studio manager. There, she engineered many of the UK's most popular radio shows and live music sessions, Working from the BBC's Made of Ale Studios, she developed her critical listening skills by working with a wide variety of artists on numerous sessions and has been credited on records by Corinne Bailey Ray and KT Tunstall, among others. In 2009, Sarah decided to take a break from broadcasting, left the BBC to explore a different career in brewing, I approve. <laughs> However, <laughs> in recent years, she has felt a strong calling back to music and returned to her online mixing and mastering business, serving unsigned rock and indie bands from all over the world. So pretty exciting stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with Sarah about uh, mixing great records and mastering and particularly building an online business for all this and really having quite a remarkable comeback. So please welcome Sarah Carter to Recording Studio Rockstars. Sarah, are you ready to rock? Yes, I'm ready to rock. It is great to have you here. Tell us a little bit more in your own words about uh, getting into the recording and the music stuff. And then, of course, I have to ask you about switching to brewing for, you know, for this in-between period and find out more about that, too. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, I live in uh, Basingstoke um, in the UK, so I'll correct your uh, pronunciation. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's in the south of England and, um, but I originally came from the north of England, um, in, from a town called Halifax in West Yorkshire. Um, I came from a, uh, musical family. Um, and so it was kind of inevitable that I was going to fall into this, uh, career at, at some point or another. Um, but, um, in terms of, of the uh, audio engineering, I've been a professional audio engineer for over 10 years, um, although I started way before that. I, I, I've probably been engineering for 
collectively about 18 years. Um, and um, uh, what I decided to do was try my hardest to uh, get a job in the industry. And mm -hmm. after taking some training, I landed that dream job in the BBC and worked with some amazing people, uh, engineers as well as artists um, and bands, and, um, you know, got the best training in the world. Um, and yeah. and now and now I I'm I'm back and I I'm loving working with independent rock and indie bands, you know, trying to help them um, get more fans and have mixes that stand up against the major label releases. That's great. Um, you know, to hear the story of you working for the BBC, some, somehow for me over here in the U.S., the BBC it just just sounds so exotic. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know you. you you hear about the BBC, you know, it's been around for so long and there's, there's incredible history to the, the art of recording and, and television and audio and the equipment and everything like that. And then, you know, sometimes I'll stumble on a document where the BBC has explained and written out exactly how you design a perfect vocal booth and things like yeah. that. And yeah. that kind of stuff really just blows me away. Are you aware of, you know, an equivalent to that over here in the US or is the BBC really just its own unique entity like that? Um, I, I think the BBC, the BBC is pretty hard to beat, really. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, there are recording studios that, um, yeah. you know, like Abbey Road, who have been involved in, in uh, obviously, uh, equipment design and microphone design and, and what have you. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's why I called it the dream job. Really, I couldn't think I couldn't think of anyone I'd much rather work for. Really, what um, were some of the things that you remember learning and just being kind of knocked out by when you when you were first at the BBC? It, I was just I was knocked out by the atmosphere of the whole place, um, all the studios, knowing you know, the people that had come and gone and been interviewed from Winston Churchill to, um, wow. you, know, you know. To Doctor Who, to, come on, throw Doctor, Doctor Who, Who in there. <laughs> yeah, to Doctor Who. I mean, that's it. I, I at Made of Ale, they had the, um, uh, the BBC, oh, I can't remember what it was called, the workshop that produced uh, all the sound effects for Doctor Who. Oh, it's, a, it's such that, great stuff. That, tar that TARDIS sound. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how do you do that? How do you air was, TARDIS? I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> yeah, air TARDIS. Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, well, what about some of the aspects of the equipment, too, or, or the um, design of a recording space? What are some things? Did you, did you come away with a real... Um, with? I know... <laughs> You know, I, for, forgive me, because as we began this, you said you talked about how you really focused on mixing and mastering and not so much on recording. But um, just remembering from back then, do you remember having a better understanding of, of what goes into a good sounding space to record in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I When I first started um, uh, recording in, a, in my home studio back in the mid, mid 90s, um, that was that was an issue. I didn't know how, what a good sounding, a good sounding recorded guitar sounded like, for example, or a good sounding snare sounded like in the context of recording so that when you put it all together, it would all sound amazing. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, it all sounded crap. So, <laughs> which I'm sure <laughs> well, is true. For it's good to learn what a crappy snare sounds like too, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that, the, I, when I started at the, the BBC, we were, um, we started on a two year training course and we weren't allowed anywhere near the equipment for, for a good sort of, uh, three or four months or so, we just sort of uh, trailed uh, programs to find out how it all worked, how it all mm. came together and what the role of a studio manager was. Um, but that all those hours, not only in my training period, but, but the, the whole sort of um, six years, six and a half years that I was there, sitting at the back of the room, um, or sitting, you know, at, in the sweet spot in the, at the front of the desk, 
I was the best training. Um, you know, my listening skills are, I completely, I attribute to all my time at the BBC. I don't mm-hmm. think they would be anywhere near as good if I'd have just carried on doing this um, on the side at home. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I came out of the BBC knowing what sounded good, what sounded not so good. And that would, that helps enormously. And and it's only something that people can gain by just doing, mixing, recording, just doing it over and over and over again. Yeah. And getting, getting in your 10,000 hours or whatever, you know. What, what were some things that you remember learning about um, great sounding monitors or monitoring um, when you were at the BBC too? Did, is it the situation where you just go and you listen on the monitors somewhere and you're like, man, that sounds great. And you don't really have any understanding of why the speakers sound good in that situation? Or did was there some training involved where you, where you began to really understand how you might want to set up your own monitoring in your own studio at some point? No, there was no training um, like that as such, not in terms of acoustics. Um, I did the acoustic training um, at SAE. Um, there, was a, there was an awful lot of that there on the course. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I learned how crappy NS10s sound at the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm staring at a pair right now as we talk. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't use them, uh, but we, had, we always had a pair sort of under the desk um, in case guest engineers wanted to use them. Yeah. Um, what did uh, you use? Was there a favorite speaker or anything like that? We had, um, we had PMCs, um, uh, huge PMCs, and we had some near field monitors, which I can't for the life of me remember. They were made by an ex-BBC engineer, I think, who went on to um, produce... Uh, studio monitors um, as a, you know, um, as a living for himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's not very well known. Um, but uh, yeah, we, the, the monitors stayed the same throughout all the studios and the uh, outside broadcast vehicles all ha- had the same monitors in. So now I remember hearing, oh, sorry, I, I remember hearing that um, Abbey Road would, would have a lot of the, uh, Bowers and Wilkins, the B and W speakers oh, in yeah. there, and yeah, that, but, they do. so there, the BBC didn't feel compelled to do anything that that Abbey Road did as a, and just copy it, or was it sort of a different different worlds? Were you guys, you know, mixing and matching ideas at all? Um, it, we had the Bowers and Wilkins speakers in the um, uh, in the large studio at Maida Vale, which is Studio One, uh, much like Abbey Road, which. Studio One at Maida Vale was for uh, the symphony, symphony orchestra, the concert orchestra, and any, you know, um, classical recordings. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had B&W speakers in there, the, the same ones that you see in all the photos at, um, at Abbey Road and, and what you see at various uh, mastering houses. Yeah. Um, uh, but that was the only studio that, that had them. Um, and I was in the rock and pop side of, Mm -hmm. uh, of radio. And I did a little bit with, uh, with radio three, which is the classical network. Um, but the, the two never sort of met. Um, so I didn't see much of that side of things really. Well, Um, you were, you were doing live recordings and that sort of stuff for BBC, like the, um, uh, Get Your Freak On cover by yeah. Katie Tunstall, right? That you shared with us. And rock stars, of course, um, Sarah shared a, a bunch of YouTube clips for her work, which I put into a YouTube playlist in the blog post. So just click through and, and you can check out any of the stuff we're talking about. But uh, tell us about that session. Yeah, from uh, it was a long time ago. It was, it was about 2004, I think, um, 2005 maybe. But I, it's one of those sessions that has stayed in my memory. I recently uh, met up with um, Katie Tunstall uh, last year and uh, was fortunate enough to be able to speak to her and, and talk to her about it. And she remembered it um, as well. Nice. And she says she she said, oh, yeah, I, I get I often get those recordings out and have a listen just to kind of remind herself of 
you know, times gone by and where she came from and all that sort of thing. Um, she was like, it's the only time I ever had a good monitor mix. I remember that <laughs> session. No, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, I was struck um, uh, by her ability with the loop pedal, you know, I don't know if you yeah. with her work, but she was one of the f- first artists for me that used this loop pedal um, to create uh, rhythms um, uh, to sing to and play guitar to. Uh, and I just thought it sounded amazing. It's fantastic. And then when she pulled that cover off, I, I, was, I was, I was gobsmacked completely. I thought it was brilliant. And then. <laughs> Thank uh, you for I'll, using the word gobsmacked on the podcast. That may <laughs> be a first. I, I love that term. <laughs> oh, great. I love that. Brilliant. Um, yeah, it was, um, I think it, from memory, it was very, simple session because when you're going live when you're doing live radio it's always best to keep things simple and uh, i i would you know imagine it was um it was just it was fairly sm58s all around and um something a bit nicer for the guitar and uh, some nice di's and you know um it was uh it was a great session and uh I was very flattered that she recently brought out a, a bit of an am, an album, BBC Sessions, I think, and it was on there. She, she oh, picked, cool. Yeah. So that was nice, yeah. Um, now, when you do a session like that, uh, maybe you can just kind of uh, briefly explain how some how a, a live sort of radio session works for the rock stars. Um, you know, the idea of it keeping it, the equipment simple is smart mm-hmm. because you want to make it very reliable and you don't want to get stuck trying to get the sound. You want to just get the performance. Mm-hmm. Um, but what about mixing? Is mixing something that would people should expect to do later and take time with it? Or is it something you should expect to do in the moment when the performance is happening? It was in the moment. It was, uh, you know, you were mixing live to air. Um, okay, all right. But you had uh, a good sort of uh, few hours, two or three hours beforehand to set up get the sounds going, swap mics in and out if you wanted to, get everything working. And of course, the artist needed to warm up because it was the the live lounge sessions, which is what uh, that Katie Tunstall session was for Radio 1, was always... So with, with an audience? No. <laughs> no, it's live in the sense that it was played live to air. It wasn't mm-hmm. a recording. And um, um, yeah, the... Um, the session was um, prepped for beforehand, as I say, in, in two or three hours, and the artist needed to warm up because it was like ten o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> they they just you know needed they needed to coax their voice into sounding somewhere near human, you know. Yeah, she probably finished her gig like you know six hours ago. Yeah, that's right, and it's it's it was tough for them, you know, but. Um, uh, people love to do it, and it was in the UK. It was certainly um, uh, a well-loved part of Radio One's output. I mean, just just the concept of getting your freak on at 10 a.m. in the morning is that right there is a, a bit of a conundrum. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, a quagmire. Do you do you have any remem- uh, or any memories of some of the challenges of doing a live mix to radio? Anything you can kind of give us some insight into what what somebody runs into in that situation yeah it's the first 30 seconds where it all sounds like crap and you've got to uh do some firefighting to get things uh into some sort of um order um this happened this is more frequent when we used to do uh uh concerts and festivals which you'll probably know about you do the hay bale thing yeah. don't you it's the whole it's the the um, challenge of the first verse, the vocal's never quite yeah. right on the first verse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're, you're blowing out compressors and, and things like that. And it, it was, that was always the, the immediate challenge because they'd been rehearsing and, uh, you know, not quite giving it their all, you know, yeah. saving the best for the performance. And then, you know, you just, but you know, you, they all did that. So you kind of knew. Um, and so you would, uh, start off with your levels, certainly quite conservatively, and then um, rely a lot on compression as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I remember discovering is that uh, it's an interesting, 
aspect of vocal compression. For example, if you're in the studio, a vocal compression happening through something like a 1176, where you 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 know you you're handling both knobs and you're gaining mm. into it and making everything hotter, is fine because you can really dial it in. But in the live situation, those are places where if you use something like an LA two A where you're really not trying to add more gain. It's just that when the vocal gets too loud, you're trying to bring the threshold down and, and mm -hmm. sort of control the levels. That's where that kind of compression comes in really useful, I find. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, we uh, when the studios at Made Avail, we had um, SSL desks. So, we, you know, it was always the uh, desk compressor that would help. Yeah. And that's, now, that's those ones, those, with the SSL desk compressor, of course, as you gain... Or as you change the threshold of the compression, you are sort of auto gaining and making yeah. the track louder. But That's they right. do have a clever way of doing somehow doing both at the same time, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's magic. Yeah, it is. It's just magic. It's, yeah, um, but the, the the studio we used to do the live lounges in though was um, uh, kind of a um, uh, it didn't have an SSL. We it was a, a Spirit Ghost. Um, oh, right. Was pretty it domestic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, you know, um, eight bus mixing console. And we had all with outboard geared. We, I think the uh, it was drama compressors. Uh, I think we had a, nice. a couple of 1176s, though, that were um, uh, sort of plumbed in, ready to go. And just one or two, you know, an echo unit, reverb unit. That was it. The live lounge was very much, very quite rough and ready. Um, and that's what it needed to be. There was no point a band coming in and it sounding like the record for the live lounge. That was the appeal of the live lounge. Yeah. That's so, a lesson I keep learning repeatedly at the Bonnaroo Haybell studio is as, as an engineer, I was all, um, you know, my ego is ahead of me and I'm, and I'm all excited and proud about the fact that we can mic up a band and get it to sound you know, just like the record or, or try to do that. And then, you know, I keep learning over and over again that, that for radio, dude, they've already got the record. They don't mm -hmm. need another version of the record. You need something that sounds different, like an yeah. acoustic and a vocal or some, you know, a glockenspiel or a little, yes. you know, Casio keyboard, something that sounds really interesting and new. Yes, a Celeste. We had lots of uh, Celestes at the BBC. And the, the, the corridors were lined with Celestes and B3s. Of all things, wow, wow! So, Do you guess you need a new home for any of those? I yeah. could probably, you know, I get a shipping <laughs> container and bring a few back here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another thought that pops into my mind uh, from the Haybell Studio, and and maybe you ran into this too, is that uh, you know the reverb and the delay; those are simple, useful tools for mixing. You're not in the live mixing situation. You're not going to get super crazy complex with all yeah. kinds of um, extra effects. But um, but the delay, particularly, I learned to have like it's really important if you can to have some sort of you know a pedal or something up on the edge of the console that you can tap tempo right in oh, the moment yeah. during the mix. Yeah. And did you find yourself doing a lot of that as well? Um, it was yeah. We had the um, the Tower of Power that we uh, affectionately nicknamed it. Um, you know, uh, right on our sort of left or right hand sides where we would have stacked all the additional outboard that we, excuse me, that we wanted yeah. apart from what was already installed in the truck. Um, and inevitably there would, you know, there'd be a delay unit on there that we could just reach over and, you know, uh, tap, tap out the tempo as yeah, needed. Ho hopefully the tap tempo button is nice and big and fat and easy yeah. to hit and you don't yeah. accidentally like, you know, switch the preset hitting the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, that I, I feel like that's an important one to share because a lot of times, um, you know, they're, I think even mixing in the studio um, with automation, that could be more helpful. Uh, I think, you know, it's it's such a given to think, oh, I'll just put it in, you know, it's the, de the delay is synced to the tempo of the song. And it doesn't really have to be, you know, it's like if you could tap tempo it or you know you may even want to change the speed of the delay live during the performance and have mm. it short and then long and stuff like that and uh, it'd be very cool to have some of those tools as part of the automated mixing on the computer side of things yeah. as well yeah yeah no, it was um my time um at the bbc 
um, as I say, I, I left in about in 2009. And so all my learning was on large format consoles and analog outboard gear. And mm. we recorded to the Sony Dash um, uh, tape. And the all we would have is just a very basic uh, door at the back of the room that we would record the stereo track to, um, and a- along with backups on DAT. Um, so it didn't really, I didn't get involved in in mixing on a computer until I left, um, I, until I left the BBC and started my own uh, business. Um, By the way, does that feel ironic today to say backups on DAT? Yeah, no. <laughs> that was, so uh, we should share. So Rockstar's the the DAT is the digital digital audio tape is I think what it stood it for. It is, right? yeah, yeah. And it, these little teeny cassette um, that were sort of weren't they like hi eight video cassettes or something? Yeah, no. I think so. They were, they, they yeah. were. I, I don't. Yeah, I have some sort of memory of them being involved in video somehow. But they, they were, were t- t- tiny, tiny, right? cute little things. Yeah. Um, so at the time, they were this remarkable, like, what a great tool. It's cheap, and you can put, like, two hours of audio on a little tape. It's very affordable. And, of course, we were all just completely overlooking the fact that these things were totally unreliable. Yeah. <laughs> that, are, that are backup tapes. Like, you know, last time I pulled one out, it just, you know, the tape snapped in half, and the de- and the DAT machine doesn't even play anymore. Yeah, yeah. Sort we used to back up to two DAT machines for that very oh, purpose. There, there you go. We had two backups. And All then right, we so, would, oh, sorry. Then we would burn this, uh, burn a CD of the um, of the stereo track, mixed yeah. track from the um, the door. Nice. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode um well, okay so i i cut you off there you're telling it starting to tell us about your transition um and it, also i thought i'd ask you before you do sometimes i like to ask on the show for our guests to share an inspirational quote and i wondered if there was anything you had or you know anybody that inspired you um, at that chapter of of your recording that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I, uh, in terms of quotes, I've I've got a couple actually that I that seem to make their way to the front of my brain. Um, and the, the there was uh, the the first one is by George Eliot, the novelist uh, George Eliot, and she nice. said, um, "It's never too late to be what you might have been," uh, which applies to my uh, my journey so far. That's and then um, I love it. I don't know whether Henry Ford actually said this or not, uh, but I like it anyway. And it's um, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. I love so, that quote. Yeah. And they're both kind of, um, you know, I, I, they're very applicable to um, my life now. Um, so, I, yeah, they, they, they seem to find their way onto desktop screensavers and I think know. they're they're great inspirations and, and they kind of go one before the other too. So uh never too late to be what you might have been. Mm. It's like, you know, like enough with the excuses, now's just as good a time as any. Uh-huh. And then and then the Henry Ford one is sort of like, okay, now that you're ready to be what you might have been, um you you're the limit of your vision or the limit of possibility is, is basically just the limit of your vision. It's like, you know, mm. whatever you decide you're going to do, that's sort of a lesson I've learned. It's like, be, uh, it's, it's almost like, be careful what you wish for. Cause it's like, whatever you, you decide you do, uh, whatever you're going to decide to do is probably going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, that's something that has been said to me since I was a little girl, it was, you know, if, if it's meant to be, it was meant to be. And I, I feel, 
I really believe that because I think that's what happened with the BBC and uh, in, in me being fortunate enough to um, to get the job there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what you focus on um, usually ends up ends up happening. You know, if you can um, give enough time and enough patience and uh, and faith, it will. It, usually, something comes along, and um, you know, whether it's karma or or what, it's um, it's nice to think that. You know, just concentrate on what you want and who yeah. knows. Yeah. Well, so you made a switch in 2009. Um, and I, I think that was that the time. No, no, that's when you came back. But when you left the BBC, what, what was it that you went to go do for a while? Um, I went to um, to brew beer. Um, I, lo- I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I felt as though I needed a change. I'd worked um, at the BBC for about six and a half, seven years. And the schedule is pretty um, relentless uh, when you are in the in the rock and pop uh, group um, uh, uh, in BBC Radio. You do a lot of um, festivals, gigs, uh, sessions, um, and you you do various various different hours. Nothing nothing regular, just like a record a regular recording yeah. studio, but with the yeah. travelling. The added traveling to gigs and and um, festivals um, all over plus, the UK. Or were you guys leaving the country as well? Uh, yes, um, I uh, I wasn't fortunate enough to go too far afield. I think I ended up in Scotland. That was about it. I think. Oh no, we I went to Berlin once, um, which was very 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 cool. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it is. It was a pretty grueling schedule. And I lived about an, um, an hour, an hour and a half commute um, outside of London as well, which I used to do on a motorbike. Um, Every so, day you'd commute an hour and a half into work? Yeah. An hour and a half home? Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. On a motorbike in all weathers. Um, so after, you know, six, six, seven years, it kind of started to take its toll. And uh, coupled with that, um, I had a big dose of the imposter syndrome as well. So I just felt uh, it was almost like a panic that I needed to get out of the BBC and do something different and yeah. do something less stressful. Um, and at the time, my hobby was brewing beer. Um, I used to do it at home in the garage. <laughs> and uh, I, I won um, a couple of uh, home brewing competitions and uh, thought, hey, wouldn't this be fun if I did this for a living? Which is exactly the same thought I ha- I'd had back in the late 90s uh, when I was uh, sat in my home studio uh, right. you know, doing my hobbying there. Um, and so it all kind of came around and happened all over again. And I made that happen. Um, well, that's pretty wild. So... Um- so you're brewing beer. Is the is the beer brewing and sort of like the micro brewery boom similar in the UK as it has been here in the US over the past yeah. twenty years? I guess really. Yes. Yeah. I mean, well, there's always been that traditional ale angle here in in the UK. Um, uh, t- t- traditional English bitters and and uh, and uh, pale ales and things. But man, I haven't had a bitter since I was in, in yeah. England. <laughs> Oh man, you're making me miss it. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's great. Um, but you know, people love US beers here. They just love American beers, and I do as well. They, they're just a complete um, another level of flavor. That's hilarious. So, so, so for you guys, a a Budweiser cold but <laughs> on tap is is an interesting thing. No. <laughs> okay. Not, all right. <laughs> not Budweiser. No Budweiser. Yeah. That doesn't taste of much, really, does it? Do you, no, do you have any favorite American beers? Uh, well, the Sierra Nevada. Um, mm-hmm. oh, have you God. had Stone? Yes, yes, Stone IPA. Uh, they do. They've got a load, haven't they? Stone and yeah. um, uh, uh, some uh, Goose Island stuff. Um, but I think that I don't know. It's a bit uh, mass market. But what? What about? Oh gosh. We've got Dog, some new Dogfish breweries Head. here in Nashville. Too. Oh yeah, Dogfish Head is good, yeah. and, and we yeah. have some new ones here in Nashville. Um, if you get the chance to try Bearded Iris, the oh. home style, that's one of the ones I like. 
Are you are you a fan of the home style brewing sort of out of New England, of uh, the cloudy IPAs? Oh yes, yeah. Um, that that took a lot of convincing to the uh, UK market that cloudy beer was fine. You know, it was good. It it don't be worried for cl- about cl- a cloudy beer, because historically in the seventies, cloudy beer meant it was off. It was bad. Right. Right. Uh, so it that. Even now, still is taking a lot of education for UK drinkers to actually drink a beer that's cloudy, and of course, the American beers, the American style beers, you drink ice cold, which makes mm-hmm. it even cloudier. So, um, so yeah, they, it's uh, it, but it definitely has been an explosion. People younger, the sort of younger generations love uh, that, the American style beers. That's great. Well, I'm looking forward to coming back to the UK at some point. I, I had a, you know, an epic two month chapter of my life where I was in London, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's epic in the sense that when, it, when you're 23, you say, quote, I lived in London for two months, which is like <laughs> a little bit absurd, you know, it's really just a, a stop off visit. Yeah. But, um, but I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to be there and I uh, got to work in a pub. And I and I got I got in trouble. I got to know I live so you know rockstars. If you uh, it's traditional or it was traditional that if you get a job in a pub, they might have rooms and boarding upstairs, and you you get to stay in a a dorm room and work there, um, which I did. And I remember going up one one day, and I had a note, and it was like you know you need to have be tidied up, um, have this place. Um, it said like have this place hoovered and cutlery yeah. removed by tea time or <laughs> find other accommodations and i was like wow these guys are hardcore and well, the, but then the, the second part of me was like i don't understand these words <laughs> what is cutlery <laughs> what do i have a sword <laughs> laying around or something you know <laughs> and and i had to have somebody translate hoovered for me so that means hoover, vacuum yeah. they meant like vacuum and tidy up your room yes, which is really yeah. funny yeah, I still say Hoover and we have a Dyson, so it's just, you know, uh instilled in British culture, I think. That's great. That's great. Well, so um did you go on and have some success with brewing before you decided you were ready to start doing some music again? Yeah, yeah. Um again, uh, you know, I, I had great fun um uh brewing for a, a microbrewery and uh we won some awards, which is always nice. And um, I had a great time. I, you know, I, I started off as, as just an assistant brewer and ended up being head brewer, which is a, a good accomplishment, I think. Um, but, you know, I, it didn't take uh, how long did I, I did that again. It's the same sort of time span, sort of seven, seven years. So I so that was. From 2009 to... I think this is an expression. It's called the seven-year itch. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of it. So uh, let's see what happens uh, in, the, now, in the next three. I have to ask a, a bit of life advice from you um, related to beer. Uh, based on your pictures that I've seen, you seem healthy and you, you don't have the look of somebody who's drinking a lot of beer every day. How do you surround yourself in a world of beer and and keep that balance and stay healthy and all that? Yeah, I, that's interesting. I I think I did when I was home brewing before I did it for a living. I did I did get a bit heavy around the middle, which I wasn't happy with. Uh, but I worked that off. Uh, but you know, when you work in an industry like that and you're surrounded by it by beer. Um, and you have to taste beer at nine o'clock in the morning to make sure that it's okay to go move on to the next stage or the next phase of, of, of its brewing uh, life. You kind of kind of go off it a little bit. You know, I, I, I was always aware that I should, you know, in moderation is, is always best. So right. whilst I could bring home as much beer as I wanted, um, I usually had some sort of um, self-imposed limit so that I didn't go too crazy. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's sort of. Um, I imagine that there's similarities to doing music. You're, you know, when you do music professionally, it changes the way you listen and, yeah, I guess consume music. Um, you still can enjoy it and love it, but it's, um, it's yes. just different. You know, it's just different how you 
how you yes. listen to stuff. Yeah, that, that's that's what happened. That was another reason uh, towards the end of the BBC. I, I I couldn't listen to music and enjoy it for what it was anymore. I was just hearing everything in its individual part as an individual component. Um, I wasn't enjoying it as a song anymore. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I decided that I needed a break. I've talked a little bit more about that, about that um, feeling and I, sort of identifying that feeling uh, because I imagine some people are struggling with some version of that as well. Yeah, it's it's really it was really difficult at the time because I, uh, as I said, I, I, um, I think I said I, I came from a musical family, so music was always there. It was always underlining anything that I did. Um, you know, I, there, there was always some sort of music on in the background. And then that that love for it kind of waned a little bit and disappeared um, because I just was saturated um, with all this with all this great music and some of it not so great because you don't love all music. You know, there's some music just wasn't to my wasn't my cup of tea, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, that so, carries more. Your cup of tea carries more weight over there than it does here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, a, a comment on that is I, I've, and I've commented on this before on the podcast, but I learned quickly that there's, you can, um, there can be music that you don't, that might not be your cup of tea, but you can gain an, a, an, a love and appreciation for the craft of making a different yes. style of music too. Yes, absolutely. Um, I can complete, I was exposed to all sorts of music, all different kinds of, um, music making. And I, just this appreciation of the musician and you know what they were trying to convey in their music making and what it meant to them and I could completely see that and feel that from them um and I you know I had complete respect for what they were doing um and admiration even though it was, wasn't one I was going to go rush out and buy um I was still uh in awe of of their of where music took them emotionally. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a pretty amazing thing to see a musician in a studio um, working on a piece of music and um, and then recording it. And you feel, you can feel the energy, the vibration. It's when they get it right and they know it and they're, you know, they're singing or playing their guitar, whatever it is that they're doing, it comes through the speakers and, it's emotional and you can feel it. And that I love that. I really did love that side of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think it was maybe Joe Costa that was talking about recording vocals. And when the singer hits that moment in the take, it's as if the vocal sort of steps forward out of the speakers to, toward you or something. Yeah. It, becomes, it just becomes more three-dimensional. Uh -huh. um, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's very cool. Uh, you know, another aspect of that was discovering that you know, I, I found myself sometimes working on music where the sessions themselves were so enjoyable and the people were so nice and it was like, it was very pleasant and there was a lot of positive mm -hmm. about it, but my God, I was never going to listen to that record ever again <laughs> after <Yeah>. the session. <laughs> yeah, because you, you, you already listened to it God knows how many times, you know, it's been played yeah. over and over and over. So, uh, so yeah, there was that aspect of it as well. Um, well, very cool. Well, how about an introduction to um, restarting your mixing business uh, before we take a break here? Yes, yeah. So there I was in the brewery, and uh, it was a slow, um, a slow process, really. Um, whilst I enjoyed my time at the brewery, it was music was always there. It was, and also the regret of leaving the BBC. I knew it was right for me at the time. And, um, and I probably would do it again if, if I was, you know, in the same, with the same circumstances and the same feelings, I would do it again. But it took a long time to get over and to accept that I'd given up the dream job. Um, yeah. and, and I, you know, quote unquote, couldn't do it or I wasn't good enough. Um, did you, did you consider for a moment that 
Maybe you didn't need to quit the BBC. You just needed to get a car to drive to work every day. <laughs> oh, it's just, that's even worse. That's even worse with a motorbike. At least I could get to work uh, on time. I knew, you know, you right. can get in and out of the traffic. Uh, but a car, you it was a bit of a game of roulette, really. Um, I, was, I was thinking that ironically, you know, not only did you not get to listen to music on the drive, you know, and have that whole experience of understanding recordings in the car speakers. Yeah. But but maybe a motorbike was kind of loud and, you know, maybe, I don't know if you had to wear earplugs on the way yeah. to work. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was very aware of that. So um, I, I wore earplugs. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it was, um, you're right. I never thought that. That would have been a great sort of learning environment um, in the car to listen to all that. All. But do you know what? I wouldn't have done because... I would have been listening to music all day at work, so I would not would have, have wanted to listen to it in the car. You would have but listened to a podcast like this? I night. probably would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you you started thinking about the BBC thing, and then and then um, that sort of sparked the desire to start yeah. a new studio? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to conquer this, this sort of feeling. Um, I, I was, as I say, it took a lot of getting over. And I, I, there was some form of regret and, um, I couldn't listen to music, uh, for a long time after leaving the BBC or, or I could, but as long as I listened to a different genre. So I used to listen to jazz a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, some genre that I didn't, I wasn't involved in at the BBC and, um, the, I decided that I needed to get some sort of help in getting over it really. It had been long enough and I was fed up of not wanting to listen to music anymore because it had always been such a major part of my life and my family's life. So um, I decided to go and get some hypnotherapy. and wow. work, Yeah, and work through it. Um, I was sceptical, you know, um, but I was at a point where I was willing to try. And, um, you know, what can I say? It, it worked for me. Um, even going into it with scepticism, it worked for me. And um, it took um, a month or maybe two months. And out of nowhere, I just got this sort of urge or certain a thought process to want to mix music again. It was, I don't, it just kind of just became known, made itself known in my head. Wouldn't it, you know, oh, like, I, did it I, sound like this? Sarah, you <laughs> want to mix music again. <laughs> oh, God, that was uncanny, Lidge. Don't do that. That's freaking me out. <laughs> it's taking me back to the uh, to the, the therapy yeah. couch. Yes, yeah. Um, but, yeah, there it is. That, that, that's, that's how it happened. And I, I, I bought uh, an iMac, I think it was. Uh, I bought Studio One. And... Cool. Uh, Bought a subscription to dueling mixers and oh, nice. yeah, and just thought, well, let's see if I can still do it. And um, I'm pleased to say that it turns out I can. Um, I don't use Studio One anymore. Um, I, I moved on to Pro Tools now. Um, and I'm, I'm not subscribed to dueling mixers anymore, but I do. I have a lot of time for, you know. You're, you're dueling with your own mixers now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, very cool. Well, let's take a break for uh, just a minute for the jam session, and we'll come back in and we'll dig in deeper into your new studio and talk about these amazing sounding records that you're making now. Rockstar is a reminder that you can find links to what we're talking about here with Sarah uh, in the show notes, including a YouTube playlist with her music in there, so you can go listen to it. And we'll be back in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, 
install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Vintage Series V67 and V11 with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a classic, expensive vintage sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTAR to get 50% off their Vintage Series microphone. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the V67. Wouldn't it feel great to have one of these in your studio? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Sarah Carter joining us from the UK. And we're going to talk about her studio that she's got now and mixing and mastering awesome sounding records. Sarah, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. Awesome. Tell us about your studio. Now, you know, you kind of left the world of brewing and started mixing again. Did you build a home studio for yourself to mix out of now? I, I did. Yeah. Um, I, I mixed from home, um, done the classic thing really and converted a bedroom. Um, but, um, yeah, I've got it all acoustically treated. Um, and I use, uh, uh, some nice, smallish monitors and I work on Pro Tools um, and I have lots and lots of fun with lots and lots of plugins, which I'm a bit of a geek and I love gear. So uh, I, that's a part of mixing that I, I enjoy is trying new, trying new plugins. But at the same time, um, it can be a bit of a curse as well as a blessing. <laughs> yeah. If you look at my plugin list, you can see it's immediately a curse. Um, let me, I, we definitely want to get into that, but let me back up a sec. Can you describe the sort of size and shape of your bedroom and then some of the things you had to do to, to um, you know, acoustically treat the space? And then all, also tell us about your, your speakers. You intentionally said they're smallish. Is that, is that part of, ma you know, making the speakers match the size of the room, for example? Yeah. Yes, it was. They're, they're five inch speakers. So that, you know, they're not overly large. The room is um, a, a double bedroom. So uh, I, I'm not very good with dimensions. Um, so I'm not Double quite bedroom sure. me means that it's bigger than your average bedroom? Uh, it means it's, it's big enough for a, uh, a king size, a king size bed, really, and wardrobes. Okay. And, you know, so um, it's for two people. So it's a reasonably sized room, um, but the last thing I wanted to do was buy huge monitors um, for the for the space. It just wasn't didn't seem right, yeah. and wouldn't wouldn't sound right. So I stuck with some um, five inch uh, monitors from Focal, the French uh, monitor company. Yeah, um, they they work really well for me because they're quite kind of hi fi sounding, and I'm uh, hi fi. Uh, fanatic of old so uh, they kind of suit um, my listening style I suppose um, so I can make uh, good judgments on them um, I think I think Josh Harris who's been on the podcast has a pair of the five inch focals and he mm -hmm. also has something called an attack wall which is this crazy array of of um, tall round diffusers and oh. in, in, in a small control room. And when I listened to those speakers in his space too, I was really struck. I was like, wow, these sound great, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, well, all I've done in, in 
the studio is uh, bass trapping in the corners, which is, uh, you know, you've got to do that really. Um, in When you're working from a bedroom of any size, you've got to sort the corners out. And so that was the first thing I did. Um, the Then I've got acoustic panels on the wall. Um, there's no foam in here because foam doesn't do anything. People don't buy foam. So uh, so they are the acoustic panels from um, GIK Acoustics in um, in England. And uh, the last thing I did, uh, which really surprised me, uh, was I put a cloud, a ceiling cloud up. Um, and immediately I could hear the difference. And, you know, I was very pleased when I'd installed that. Now, to explain to the rock stars what a ceiling cloud is or does, is it's essentially, it's panels that are hanging down from the ceiling and they're above the speaker and your listening area mm -hmm. such that they're, this the sound doesn't leave the speakers, go up, hit the ceiling and bounce back down to your ears. Instead, mm -hmm. it goes up and get, it kind of gets absorbed or diffused by the ceiling cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first reflections um, from the monitors. Um, that Those points, the first reflection points are the most important ones to sort out. The first ones to sort out anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, you, you know, the amount, there's, there's pictures I see of on Instagram of... <laughs> studio spaces and you know with a hashtag uh recording studio or whatever and i look and there's just no acoustic treatment in there whatsoever <laughs> and it just i'm amazed it looks they look lovely they probably actually look nicer than my studio but um i'm not sure quite what they sound like yeah i think you, you need it to sound good because when your music leaves your studio nobody's going to see what your studio looked like that's right yeah they're only going to hear what it sounded like um how about bass traps? Can you explain to the rock stars what, you know, what is a bass trap? What does it do? Uh, you know, another question is you just said five inch speakers. How much bass is, is there to be considering? Well, that's it. The, uh, the bass traps um, are sort of wedge shaped, triangular shaped um, constructions that fit into the corners or any corner area in the in the uh, studio because what happens is when you've got the bass frequencies or any frequency really hitting the corners it hits both um surfaces of the corner and just you know gets doubled at least in its intensity when it comes back at you so you get this overblown bass response um making you think that you know your mix is nice and bassy but um, when you actually take it out of the studio and listen to it somewhere else, it might not be quite how you thought it sounded. Um, and you end up compensating for that, that what you're hearing um, with EQ in your mix. You know, if, you, if you're hearing too much bass, you don't put enough bass into your mix. Mm -hmm. um, and then conversely, if you're not hearing enough bass, you, you wind it in with your EQ plug-in and then it just sounds awful. Um, you know, and the funny thing about mixing is that the, you know, the first couple of octaves, so up to a hundred Hertz and then up to 200 Hertz, um, <clears throat> the, uh, well, that, that's not technically the first couple of octaves, but kind of in the first two octave range, mm -hmm. that, that is where, um, it, you know, it's almost like an 80, 20 rule. That little 20% is, uh, which isn't even 20% of the frequencies we hear is like 80% of the energy of the of the mix and the music yeah. and it's the it's the place that it's so easy to get wrong in a mixing environment. Yes. Yeah, it's it, um it, it's imperative really that you give some attention to the acoustics of your room and how to treat it and what you're actually listening to cuz I mean that's everything, right? You know, if your mix is what you hear, is you mix how you hear. And if you're not hearing things correctly, then it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, you what mentioned. Some, the, oh, oh, I was go just going to expand on the the bass. You said there's not much bass coming out of five inch speakers. Um, that's correct to a point. I I have actually got a subwoofer in here as well. Um, okay. So I I've got um, the subwoofer comes in. It takes over all the it, it takes the frequencies from like eighty hertz and below. 
So uh, you, that, that takes it out of the, the monitors. Um, but that allows the sort of mid-range to come through more because the speakers aren't sort of flapping about with low frequencies, you know. Um, and so it, you, it's able to represent um, the mid-frequencies much, clean, much more cleanly and accurately. And then I just dial in my subwoofer ever so gently so that I can just just hear it and feel it because I still like to know what's going on down there, particularly below 50 hertz. You know, I mean, yeah. if I just had these monitors, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily hear anything below 50 anyway. So I, I would always have a subwoofer that I can I just a bit like controlling aspect of my personality. I, I want to know what's going on down there um, so that I don't make any um, sort of terrible mistakes. Yeah, and it's. I think it's an interesting way to hear you describe it. So maybe the first time you think about a subwoofer, you think about you know somebody putting one in a car and just making mm. everything go boom, boom, boom. You know, yeah, where it's where it's all insane. And the point of the sub is, or you know, with a, a home theater system where you're just trying to make the low end explosions sound even bigger, or your video games. Yeah. But in a mixing environment the subwoofer is meant to just sort of extend the range of what you're already hearing and not really boost it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, what about the traps? You know, what 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 is a bass trap made out of? How do you make a bass trap and put it in a home studio? Oh, well, there are, there are loads of videos on YouTube, um, how to make your own. Um, but I'm afraid I couldn't be bothered with that. Um, so I just, I just purchased some from GRK Acoustics. Um, and if you're very, if you're fortunate, you can you uh, keep your eye on that well-known um, auction site. Um, uh, you may find that they sell uh, panels that are sort of slight seconds, and you get them really reasonably priced. Um, uh, so I, that that's what I've taken advantage of in the past. Uh, but they're basically. Uh, like I explained, like, kind of like a, a wedge-shaped wooden frame filled with uh, uh, rock wool um, of a particular grade and then covered in um, a nice material, like a hessian-type material. Um, and That's a fabric. Uh-huh. And uh, it uh, plays a big part in absorbing the base frequencies that um, get uh, sort of concentrated in the corners of the room and helps and, to flatten it out, flatten out the frequency response in the room. Do these things have to be from like the floor all the way up to the ceiling or are they things that can come up like four feet and that's, that's enough and it's a tabletop or how do we, yeah. how do we think of these? Ideally it's floor to ceiling. Um, uh, mine don't quite reach the ceiling, but I haven't, I don't experience any problem with that um, I, in my room. Uh, maybe I'm just lucky, but if I were to move into another room or a different studio and start from scratch, I would go for floor to ceiling. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, well, so let's see, what about your spacing of your five inch monitors? Um, where do you find that it's smart to put the subwoofer and these speakers so that it makes it easy for you to mix? Mm. Um, ideally, uh, it's best if you can put the subwoofer, you know, in the same um, line as your monitors so they're in line with your monitors and in the center of them um, even though bass uh, is non-directional um, you can still you can still feel it I think you can still feel it if it's if it's to one side or the other um, having said that though um, my subwoofer is to one side um, which is another reason why I only dial it in so that I can only just hear it and feel it. I often, it, it's often, it's just a case of feeling it through, feeling the, vib the vibrations through the desk um, or um, on my leg, next, it's next to my leg. Nice. So it's, it's more a case of, of feeling it um, as well as hearing it. Um, I do that too. I remember um, we were making a record down in Miami with Tom Lord Algae. And mm. he was mixing and he kept reaching forward and he'd put his hand on the NS10s mm. and he'd put it on the desk. And we were like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm feeling the music, you know, feeling the music. And then yeah. I started practicing that. And now it's just force of habit. I just put my hand and I 
I feel I go to the back wall and I feel the way the low ends put, you know, vibrating yeah. the wall. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's you really you begin to understand the music that way. Um, mm. I reach down and feel the speakers on my car. Uh, or maybe yeah. we're all just weird. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> maybe we, that's but I feel it. like it helps. You know? Yeah. We're just odd. <laughs> An odd section of the community. Yeah. Um, very cool. Now, what about the the width of your speakers? And, and you know, what's your desk layout? Do you have a, a console there? Or do you just sort of have a computer mm, in I've between got, the speakers or anything like that? All I've got is um, I've got the Artist Mix from Avid and the Euphonics MC transport. So that's my desk, if you like, my uh, board, my mixing board. Um, and then a computer keyboard and mouse. Um, and I have two Bose computer speakers that I use to test mixes on. Oh, yeah, me too. Are they the, um, I don't remember what my models are. They're gray. Uh -huh. uh, and one of them has a volume knob over on yeah. the side. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, the right-hand one has a volume knob on it. Um, and they, they, they don't sound particularly nice, but it's what people will listen to your music through. So yeah. it's worth, um, running your mix through them, uh, just to check what's happening there with those as well. My monitors, um, I'm in that classic triangular shape, uh, where I'm sat at the apex of the triangle in the sweet spot where the tweeter, my ear, I guess, is kind of half, is in between the tweeter and the um, the woofer, I guess it is. It's kind of a dual mid mid-range uh, woofer cone on these speakers. So my, my ear is about uh, in between the two. And then my speakers are, um, I guess, they're about a meter, a uh, meter and a half apart because they're, the width of my monitors is governed by um, how closely I sit to the um, to the desk to be able to reach my equipment. Right. So that's how come my speakers have ended up where they are. Ideally, I'd like to be sat a bit further back, but um, that's just kind of not how it's working with the way I've got my desk arranged at the moment. Well, I think it's a good reminder that the spacing of things um, is equally influenced by the size and shape of your room and your mm -hmm. desk and how, where you're going to sit when you work and stuff. And it's a mm -hmm. combination of all those things. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I have a large, uh, Apple monitor, the big 27 inch thing. I don't think they make it anymore, but it's lovely. Uh, so I have mm -hmm. one of those and then I have a regular computer monitor as well. So I've got two screens that I use. And do they go, do you put them right in the middle, sort of side by side, same yeah. size or? Okay. Yes. All right. And then um, what What about the computer itself? Are you on a Mac? I am. I'm on a Mac Pro. I bought uh, a refurbished one from the uh, Apple Store, which I highly recommend. You save a little bit of cash and they're just like new. Um, yeah. You know? They call them cheese graters, right? Uh, no, I got the Mac Pro, so that's the new version. Oh, the newest one. Oh, yeah. oh cool. The trash yeah. can. <laughs> the trash can, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, great. So uh, what what are some things about that computer that you're like, man, I, I'm so glad I got this? Uh, um, or what are some things where you're like, oh, I didn't realize, I guess I'm going to have to get this as well in order to be able to use it the way I want? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm a Mac fangirl anyway. I, I, everything... Uh, all my computers are uh, Mac and I have the iPhone. So I'm, I'm into that ecosystem. Uh, I just love the way Macs work and feel and look. Um, I've never been a fan of Windows computers. Sorry, yeah. people who <laughs> use Windows. Um, but uh, the Mac Pro Touchwood has been great for me so far. I got it maxed out with uh, lots of RAM. I've got 64 gig of RAM, I think. Um, I went for the the sort of largest um, um, setup that I could afford in terms of computer. Um, so it's it's pretty powerful. I think six, six core kind of three and a half gig processor and all that sort of stuff. So it And should, you're working in Pro Tools, you said? I'm working in Pro Tools, yes, yes. Do, um, now, what about interfaces? Is this like a HDX system or is it all native no, or how does that native. work? It's all native. Um, and then interface, I use a PreSonus Studio 192. Oh, cool. Uh, so that, 
that's uh, again that's a bit overkill for what I need. Um, I actually I've had my eye on the um, UAD Apollo, the little right. twin thing, the little thing. I quite like the look of that, and it would save a little bit of room on my desk as well, um, and uh, get a, a bit more in terms of I get a, a few more plugins and uh, uh, power to run them. But um, yeah. So far, so good. It's all working. It's all working really well for me. So I'm reluctant to change. Uh, you know, I'm still running the uh, Sierra OS. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm on high Sierra, and I also I have an older Mac Pro. Mine's actually from 2009, mm. and then I I sort of upgraded it with the OWC SSD drives and uh-huh. um, put in the new processor, and it and it, and it really works pr- remarkably well. But I'm, yeah. I'm also a Mac fan. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but the thing as well, I think that I learned that I didn't know, um, and, and I don't think uh, certainly new um, mixers and recording uh, engineers wouldn't necessarily think of, is the speed of the hard drives that you use. Um, it's, uh, I, they're all, mine are all sort of either Thunderbolt or USB 3, but, you know, um, buy hard drives that, spin up at 7,200 revs per minute. Geek. Yeah. You see, I told you I was a bit of a geek. Gear geek. <laughs> Don't get the 5,200. Don't oh, no, get 5, the 5,400. Yeah, that's it. Don't get the 5,400. Just, you know, they'll do as a backup, a backup drive, you know. Yeah. But for, for working from, go get the fastest you can or get the solid state. Um, well, you know, something that was remarkable when I switched to the solid state drives is um, – and these are which ones I have the Mercury Extreme mm-hmm. Pro six Gs in there. Um, is when I went to go comp a vocal, and I'm using, you know, the Pro Tools feature where you can do um, uh, playlist switching with the shift and the arrow keys. Mm-hmm. It's so fast now. Yeah, I can flip from one take to another and press play and hear it immediately. And it didn't used to be like that. No, nice. I used to I used to work quickly. But then sometimes, you know, the computer would be catching up and you'd hear it switch a take halfway through the word and you realize you were listening uh, to the wrong one. It was very uh, frustrating. Uh, but uh, but it's pretty cool. And it's good advice to to make sure that you got really fast drives yeah. because, you know, you want to, you're, comp- you're asking your computer to pull all this incredible, stunning amount of data mm. off of the, the, the hard drive and then, you know, convert it and play it through your speakers for you. And if your drives are slow, it's mm. just going to be like, yeah, hang on a minute torturous yeah yeah but i i i will go solid state eventually but at the moment i don't touch wood <laughs> i don't need to when when they pack up you know maybe I, i'll go down that route i think but they've been good well again if you're mixing um you know you may have some different drive requirements than if you're comp trying to comp mm. vocals and drums as fast as you can yeah that's yeah. sort of thing. Um, but talk to us a little bit about your controllers. So you mentioned the Artist Series and the Euphonics. Mm. Um, what are those? What do they do? Um, why is something like that useful in a mixing situation? Yeah, I. Um, if you recall, I mentioned earlier that when I learned to do what I do at the BBC, it was before, and I'll tell a lie, Pro Tools was around, obviously, but it's not the system that was used at the BBC. It wasn't the way that we recorded at the BBC. So I just didn't get hands on with a door to um, edit multi-track music. Um, I would edit two track but and edit lots and lots of speech um, for radio programs. Um, but uh, when it came to editing music and working with uh, multi-tracks in a door, my uh, experience didn't go that far. Um, and so I learned to mix with faders, you know, and I found it quite the transition when I started to mix again back in 2014. I found it quite challenging to do it in the, you know, on the screen, looking at the computer, you know, using the automation, mm. uh, using a mouse. I just found it just didn't feel right and well you you had also come from another career where you're physically up and moving about all day yeah and it, it must have felt very you must have been very aware of how weird it is to just sit in this awkward position with a mouse and a keyboard 
Yes. Not yeah. kind of not moving all day. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. My chiropractor is seeing more and more of me, more and more of me <laughs> as, as <laughs> months go by. But um, you're like, I'll, I'll never be able to drink beer again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, you see, I'm not moving around as much. So that means I've got to drink even less beer than I was before. Right, right. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, the the artist mix, uh, I love it because I can feel the music again. I can listen. I can close my eyes and I can listen to how where to place a vocal or where to place that guitar solo. Uh, you know, and it it's so much more intuitive to, for me to do it that way than it is to um, work with a mouse and, um, you know, just draw it in. It's, it's not how yeah. I, I, I've been brought up. So so the artist gives you faders, moving faders yeah. to, to touch. Um, does it give you other useful knobs too that you can kind of do with your eyes closed or is, are the yes. faders really the most important aspect? Yeah, for me, it, it's the faders uh, are the most important aspect. But yeah, it's got all the solo, uh, solo and mute uh, functionality, pan. But I tend to do LCR panning anyway. So mm -hmm. once it's set, they're set. Um, and uh, the other piece of kit that I use, the Euphonics MC Transport, really, I don't use that. Um, it's a very powerful piece of kit, but I only use it to uh, zoom, use it for the zoom functions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out um, uh, the view on the uh, on, on Pro Tools. I went for it initially because um, editing. I, I thought I might get into more editing than I've ended up actually doing. And uh, at the BBC, we had brilliant hardware controllers. Uh, for the door we used, which was uh, Sadie. And Sadie is used uh, prolifically through the mastering um, uh, organization, the studios. They will use Sadie a lot. And BBC decided that that's what they were going to use to record all their radio programs with. So yeah. I learned with this fantastic hardware controller and the jog wheel that's on the um, MC Transport is much like the jog wheel that was on the on Sadie's hardware controller, and I learned to edit using in my ears again, a bit like tape. Uh, I'm sure you've edited tape, haven't you? I have. Uh, I, the last time I really edited tape, I took it to an insane level, and then I've never edited tape again after that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah. Um, so yeah, that whole rocking the reels to f to find the correct spot to splice. Yeah. Uh, effectively, I was doing that with the hardware controller and the jog wheel, and that's how um, how I edit audio as well. So that's why I got the MC Transport for the for the lovely jog wheel. But have, yeah, have you? Just, sorry, let me ask you a question about that. Have mm -hmm. you found um, that editing that way for audio? Uh, I mean, I know Pro Tools has it in there. I can turn on the scrub and kind of scrub with the mouse. Uh, I don't do it that way. I still edit sort of visually. Mm. Um, but have you found that it causes you to have different results if you edit by ear as opposed to editing visual, visually? Or do we end up with similar edit edits? They're just sort of different ways to approach it. I think when I, I cast my mind back, because I say I don't do much editing now that tends to be all done for me and it doesn't quite work as well as I'd hoped. Um, it, um, so whereas in, if I was using a Sadie system, which I wouldn't for multi-track mixing, but if I were, uh, and using their hardware controller, it's, I don't know, it's more, I think it would, I don't think it would sound any different. No. But I think I would probably edit faster if right. I were doing it by ear. So it's all about process. Yeah. And, um, fair enough. You just told me you weren't doing much editing, so dumb question, Lidge. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's keep jumping forward to mixing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've. I, I want to make sure we're talking about some of these great records that you've shared with us. Um, uh, I'll just start at the top of my list of questions. One of them, and again, these are all uh, links in the YouTube playlist, Rockstars. But Wistful Sleepers, um, mm. I think the song was Isle, or or maybe Wistful Sleepers was the song title and Isle was the band. 
Uh, but it's a it's an awesome sound. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you about getting the vocal to sit forward so well in the mix. And also, if you had any advice for making uh, a song sound wide like that one does. Yeah, uh, that remains one of my most favorite mixes that I've done to date. Um, and I did it probably a couple of years ago now. But, you know, it was so well recorded. And um, the communication between myself and um, uh, Juan, who is the keyboard player, I think, of the band, he ha- was he knew what he wanted. He knew how he wanted it to sound. And he was able to um, um, get that across to me in a way that I understood. And we just seemed to work together over email, as it is often these days. We just we just got it got it together really, really easily. And it was easy for me because it was so well recorded and because the drummer was such a good drummer. Um, and the arrangement, um, everything just kind of fitted together really well and had space. Um, the vocalist, she is she's great. Uh, and quite young. I think when you listen to her voice, she sounds much older than her years. Um, I'm not sure if I'm right. I think she's probably mid twenties or maybe early twenties when she did this. And I thought, I imagine she was sort of mid thirties when I heard her voice. Yeah. Um, cause it's, that's it's, often the sign of a really great singer, isn't it? Mm. You, you hear, uh, more, more wisdom and age in their voice. Yeah. Yeah. Age very mature sounding um and i think you know it, all that all those factors being well recorded uh the time that the band had taken to to convey to me exactly what they wanted the quality of the singer the quality of um the microphones used um I, you know it just made it i don't want to say easy because it wasn't easy but it was um it it sat quite quickly. It just came together quite quickly. Yeah. And the other thing, I I felt I loved the song as well, and um, I found it really easy to kind of get into the song and to and to go with the flow. Um, I think mixing the vocal. I think on that track, it's something I haven't done since, and I think I might try again. I used the comp- the compressor was. A plugin by Plugin Alliance. It was the Opticom. Um, oh, okay, cool. And uh, I used a Cush Cush Audio plugin on her vocal as well. The um, Kaya, I think it's called K A Y A, and nice. it's kind of like a distortion saturation plugin. Um, that's all I can remember off the top of my head. That that was different about that record um because uh juan wanted her to sound uh kind of lo-fi and she he wanted that saturated broken up kind of sound so um that's why i ended up using it uh but it it remains today one of my favorite mixes that i've done and it's the mix that i took to um sylvia massey uh when i did uh the mix with the masters seminar uh, last last year, and you wait. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think you've ever done it, have you? Um, no, I haven't done it, and I, and I, I hope to have Sylvia on the show at some point. Oh but, yeah. Um, you know, to the to the extent that you're allowed by your NDA, <laughs> can you tell us about your experience at Mix with the Masters? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was great. It really was one of the best moments of my life. Um, in terms of feedback from my peers and from somebody uh, with such stature as Sylvia Massey to listen to that track. And, and she was blown away by it. She, she loved it. And she, she said she struggled to find anything wrong to say with it. And that, that gave me such a boost. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, we've talked about imposter syndrome. That was the moment when it was, wow, maybe I am good enough. I can do this. That's great. <laughs> and that's after, you know, 16 years of doing this, you know. So yeah. 
Um, That's great. Yeah, I'm I'm proud of that record. Yeah. Um, were, did, were there any other fun takeaways from um, that mix with the master session with Sylvia? Anything you brought home and you're like, I'm going to try this as soon as I get back <laughs> to the studio? Oh gosh, yes. Uh, with Sylvia Massey, yes. The things that she does uh, with she the, the drum sounds that she can get um, by using you know garden implements is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, she uses a garden hose, you know, um, with a cool. an SM57 gaffer tip to each end, I think, and place it, lays it underneath the drum kit, and you get this really compressed drum room sound with wow. loads, loads of bottom end. It just sounds gorgeous. And then the other thing we were doing, we were dropping, putting microphones into latex gloves so that they were protected from what was going to happen to them next which was dunking them dunking them in uh great big bottles of water you know you uh, the water fountains you know you get the big water bottles that mm-hmm. sit, you know that those full of water with a microphone stuck in wow stuck in front of the drum the drum kit it just sounds amazing. Oh, so they were in the water recording the, water. the drums through the water. Oh, yes. that sounds like fun. Yes. It was I gotta, absolutely I got to hang out with Sylvia Massey at some oh, point you, and, and try yeah. all this stuff. You must. You must. You, she's amazing. You know, the thing is, you know what I appreciate about what she's doing with recording is she's bringing back all the fun stuff that I was – that we were all much – quicker to try out in the 90s Mm. but that seemed to disappear when we um when things became computer focused yeah you know it's like all the explorations it's like it's like all the great explorers disappeared into the computer like a like a um you know the story of tron (laughs) from the the 80s (laughs) yes And, and it's like you know we used to be physical explorers exploring you know the different nooks and crannies and corners of the studio um, sorry, I don't know why I said nooks and crannies. That just makes me think of Thomas's English muffins. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the uh, the you know it was all about you know what weird thing can you do with physical stuff in the studio and how can you hook these up wrong and how can you put you know send something through the speaker and re re mic it and re record it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's when stuff was it was just really fun and it was yeah. an adventure and it was like. It was also a little bit slower. You know, you had to put a little bit of love into mm. creating a sound. And then when you created it, you know, you had, there it was. Yeah. Where in the world of computers and plugins, you know, again, you're sort of physically um, constrained almost, you know, mm. as you're working and everything's, you know, in your head and in your, in this in this um, imaginary space inside the computer Mm. and then what you hear coming out of the speakers. And I think it's just a different, it's a different way of creating and it's a different way of even experiencing what you just created. Mm. And, and it's much harder also to um, reach a finishing point or commit to something because things are always in a forever changeable state, you know, Mm -hmm. because you can always just like, that sounds great, but I could, what if I do this instead, you know? Yeah. 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 No, if, um, if you could get Sylvia on the show, she will be, um, fascinating to listen to. Um, you know, she, uh, she's a trailblazer, a pioneer when it comes to recording, recording music and techniques that she's come up with, you know, um, I don't know anybody, I don't know anyone else you know, of the A-list producers out there that does what she does really to that extreme, yeah. you know, recording snare drums in cooling towers and underground stations. She was last year with, she was here in the UK. Um, and I was helping her with some re- uh, research for her, her new book that's coming out shortly about microphones. And, um, of course she was interested in the BBC's microphone collection. So I, I was able to hook her up with that, but um, she, while she was here, she was working with bands and she rented out an underground and disused underground station and recorded toms being, being played in, in, uh, an old underground station. You know, I mean, I don't know anybody else that does that these days. That's yeah. great. That's, that's fun stuff. And at the end of the day, were you guys, did you butt heads when it was time to choose beer? Did she just want to drink, uh, <laughs> she did. English beer and you <laughs> only wanted to drink American beer? 
No, it was easy because I think she just drinks apple juice. So that was oh. <laughs> <laughs> not cider either. It was, it was, you know, soft just drinks. Up, just straight up. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, you know, one other comment I wanted to make too, you talked about having great communication with the band on the Wistful Sleepers mix. And again, it reminded me of a question that we asked Tom um, when we were mixing with him, Tom Lord Algae. And we're just like, you know, what, is, what goes into making a great record, you know? And, um, you know, maybe that wasn't exactly how he phrased it, but his <laughs> answer was, was interesting because he said, you have to ha work with an artist that is very um, focused and driven and really knows what they want. Mm, yeah, you know? absolutely. That, that's, that's definitely where the, the uh, certainly the bands I've worked with where that has been um, apparent, uh, the mixes turn out better. In, in my yeah. opinion. So, and I'm my worst critic. So a mix, uh, my mixes are never finished. I could keep mixing forever. You know, I, there's all, I could keep tweaking forever, but you know, that's not going to serve the mix best in the long run. And, um, uh, you know, the client wants their mix. So you've got to stop at some point. And, uh, yeah, I certainly, um, working with an artist that knows what they want and has the, had the discussion with the band and has produced the multi-track to a state where, you know, it, uh, parts have room to breathe and uh, get wide because you, you, you were asking me about width as well. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, my job is easy then and it's fun much more fun when you mix in a, a, a record like that. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, so now, um, one thing I notice about your mixes is that they've got a real, um, there's, there's just great tone and detail in a lot of the mixes that you shared with us. Thank you. And I, I wondered if you were mixing, I, I think you've already given us the answer to this, but are you mixing totally in the box these days or do you kind of also mix through analog consoles and outboard gear and that sort of stuff? And if you are, uh, well, in either situation, um, can you talk about using, you know, the power of mix templates and mm. how you begin a mix and, you know, uh, in what ways you don't reinvent the wheel every time? Mm. Yeah, I, I'm entirely in the box. Um, I've got no analog equipment here. Um, I don't even have a desire for it. Or maybe I might look at analog summing one day that dangerous do an interesting uh, box that I, I quite like um, the idea of, but I haven't actually heard one yet. I haven't done an AB. Um, but if I do an AB and I can hear a difference, then I'm sold. So Yeah. Well, but, I mean, I got to say, just listening to your records, you know, on YouTube, mm -hmm. it already sounds to me like, you know, I already hear it and go like, oh man, is she mixing through... Is she doing something I'm not doing? So I think you're already getting it. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Um, what I, d I do to compensate for that um, is, you know, um, I use a lot of the emulation plugins. I've got UAD um, tape emulation plugins that I use on my mix bus. And um, so uh, I use the Slate um, virtual mix rack with the um, VCC. Um, plug in on my buses 
So, nice. on, you know, my drums, bass, guitars, keys, vocals, they'll all have an instance of uh, VCC on them. And then I'll have the mix bus on um on my mix bus. <laughs> and can I can I pause you just there for a moment and can yep. I get you to explain to us a little bit deeper how the VCC works? I mean, I remember when I first got it, I realized that there were like modules for the track and also a module for the mix bus. And then I was mm. like, in my brain, it was like, wait, are are these talking to each other directly yeah. in some other weird way? Is it like if I hook this up wrong, am I getting the result or am I not getting the result? Maybe you can just kind of educate us a little bit on, you know, you don't have to be the expert on it, but um, <laughs> stuff that you've discovered where you're like, no, it's working if you do this. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't think I, at first I didn't give it any great thought. I just put the, the VCC channel on the channels and then I just uh, put the mix bus on the mix bus. And I just thought, well, you know, the name's telling me where to put them. So I didn't give right. it any great thought, but it, it was um, later on I discovered or I heard, I don't know if it's correct, that they do kind of talk to each other. It does kind of filter down as as if you were mixing through an analog console. So, um, you know, I think they do. It does kind of compound as it uh, as it gets to the mix bus and to the um, to the mix bus plugin. Now um, there are um, there are selections that you can do. So the the channel yeah. can select sort of a different console mm. model, and then the stereo bus can also select. Mm. A console model, right? And then you can group things as well. So if you just change one, it's changing them across all of them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I don't use the group function. Um, and uh, the console emulation that I choose is usually the Neve. Um, in the early days, and probably for the Wistful Sleepers single, it would have been the E channel, the SSL E channel. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, probably I use that, um, but it's been in. It's actually since I've been. I went to uh, the mix with the master seminar with Sylvia that I I kind of switched over to trying out the Neve stuff. So now, is there anything that um, that you've discovered about setting levels? Because you also like, um, you know, you put it on the kick drum and you put it on the Neve, and then you're like, oh, I've got mm. this input gain. I can crank it up or I can not crank it up, and that experience begins to feel a little bit to me like trying to EQ everything in solo. Yeah. Where it's a slippery slope, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I haven't, I don't, I haven't played with that. I don't, um, I don't play with the, with the input, uh, levels at all. Um, I think because so many tracks that I get come to me so hot that, you know, I don't need to <laughs> crank up the input gain anymore. Um, that the, the, everything's recorded, seems to be recorded really hot. Um, so I just let it flow through the plugin, um, without, uh, giving it any more. Um, and it, it seems to, it seems to work okay for me so far. I haven't yeah. played with it an awful, I haven't played with it that much. Um, so I can't really expand on that any further. Well, um, and and probably no surprise that I'm I have no shortage of questions for you. But <laughs> my next one related to that is um, to help the rock stars understand that when they use these console emulation plugins, mm. I think sometimes you can approach it and think if I put this on there, it's going to be this huge transformation. Mm. And while it can be, I think I've also discovered that the console emulator plugins like that they are about adding subtle subtleties to mm. what you're doing that that when all these plugins and everything add up you end up with a that's wonderful right. sounding mix right is yeah. that you think that's a, a fair way to um to expect f what you might hear out of something like the vcc mm, yeah definitely it, it's each plugin plug plugin as long as you don't go crazy with it, it each one adds its own little bit uh harmonics here and there, um, tone, and all these little bits just end up adding up to something that sounds great at the end. And I, I rarely do I go crazy with a plugin. Um, and when it comes to sort of, uh, setting levels, I'm pretty, pretty big on 
gain staging. I, I like to make sure that everything's flowing through the console, through Pro Tools at optimum levels. And you mentioned analog emulations. You've got to kind of be a bit careful with those because, um, uh, you know, you can end up getting some pretty horrible sounds if right. you overload they're, they're them. Just- they're designed to break if you don't use them the right way and hit yeah. the sweet spot, right? Yeah. Just like the real thing. Yeah, that's right. So um, so I, I'm quite meticulous. My, I probably spend far too long uh, prepping mixes than I should um, in terms of in a business sense and, and my right. time. Because I, I, I do all my own prep um, before I mix. The day before I mix, I'll, I'll do all the prep. And yeah, I could, it's important to separate that, right, from the yeah, mixing that's time. True. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I can, on a full mix, I can probably spend at least six hours prepping it um, just to get it clean, sounding clean, get the gain staging right. So I've got no kind of, certainly no red, no clipping, no red lights. Um, and getting... The EQ set, getting the phase set, um, and then doing a very rough kind of static, static balance, and that can take me about depends on the on the uh, on the session, but it can take me six hours or more, maybe. Mm-hmm. It's so, the curse of loving what you do. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way I explain it. <laughs> it's one of the things about. Being in the creative arts uh, and the challenge of trying to always make smart business decisions around it, I think, is because because we love what we do so much, we're internally rewarded by the process, mm. and that yeah. can cause us to put in much more time than you know you might be billing for or something. Yeah. But l- let me let me get you to talk more about checking the phase on things. Do you have a process? that you go through that um, allows you to check phase when you're um, going to a mix? Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple. I, I've, I've sort of switched between a couple um, and ended up with the old tried and tested method uh, as if I were working on a console. So um, I, what I would do, what I've tried in the past, um, is the um, auto-align plugin. Um which sounds great, and I, I, you know, I played with it for some time, but I found it was just taking me so much, just a lot too too long. I was just spending more time faffing about with the plugin, and then printing printing the tracks out so that I didn't have to keep the plugin running. Mm-hmm. That and it was just so much quicker for me to put a um, to put an EQ plugin on with a phase button on it. And switch in and out and see what sounded best, and go with that. So that's what I do now. I, I tend to have um, a channel strip on uh, on either the individual channel or on the orcs, you know, on the on the um, on the su- uh, summing orcs, mm-hmm. and I just uh, use the phase button to. Um, to to flip the phase or switch the phase, um, but can I you will... break break that down just a little bit for the rock stars who maybe are trying to understand you know phase checking for the first time and you know what what kind of instruments and tracks need to have their phase checked? Mm. What does what that process look like? Yeah, that any instrument that's had multiple mics on it, so um, drums for example, that they're the main one. Drums, um, guitar cabs. If you've got two microphones or more on your guitar cabs, mm-hmm. um, what you need to do is because of the the length of time it takes for the sound to hit the capsules on the microphone, um, it, it it changes depending on the distance that the microphone is away from the sound source. And so when you've got a sound arriving at a different time um, uh, into a microphone, you can end up with uh, what's called phase cancellations and you can lose, uh, normally it's, it's bottom, end, bottom end and you can also get this kind of weird um, phasey sound where it sounds mm. like your brain's been sucked out of one of your ears. 
<laughs> that can also happen if you drink too much beer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's a really important step to take in the mix preparation to go through and check phases on all your drums and any instrument that has got multiple miking on it, acoustic guitar, for example. And and I know we're we are sort of mixing some of the terminology here that yeah. every once in a while we have to re define. Yeah. So f- so the phase is that relationship of these different waveforms, you know, right. um, summing together from different tracks or different microphones, and yes. and either either working together in unison or causing problems for each other. But the but the actual move that we do yes. is hitting the polarity button, which, That's right. which flips the polarity. So. Yes. If if the speaker was going to come forward at a certain moment in time, you hit that, you flip the polarity button, and now the speaker is going to move backward yeah. at that moment in time instead. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It. Um, uh, yeah. The terminology is wrong, but um, we got we're so used to um, hearing it being um, <laughs> expressed like that that yeah, uh, yeah. it uh, it can sometimes end up. Um, and, and that's fine. Rock stars don't sweat it. I mean, it's just when people say check phase, that's what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so, so you're talking about, uh, you know, if there's multiple mics on drums, you're checking that the close mic polarity on the kick drum, for example, mm-hmm. is working with the polarity of the overheads and not fighting it. Yep. Um, and so you go through all the mics and you kind of check them against each other. Yeah. But um, how do you avoid sort of having an infinite number of possibilities to check all against each other? Yeah, I just end up, I, I've chased my tail on this many times and I always just go back to, well, what sounds right? So, um, what I will do is, uh, another, another method I will use is actually to zoom right in on the waveform and just, and physically look at the polarity, you know, look, uh, how the waveform, um, has, has been recorded, you know, whether mm-hmm. it, it has a positive polarity or negative when it when the transient hits compared mm-hmm. to the overheads let's say if we're talking about a kick drum um and is there one that's that should be better than the other i mean like when well, that to, kick drum hits yeah, which to, way should it go <laughs> well, <laughs> i guess it's subjective but to my mind it should go positive first to negative because a kick drum to me you you want the speaker cone pushing outwards Mm-hmm. And positive polarity is where the speaker cone's pushing outwards. Negative is where it's being sucked back in. And uh, assuming your cables are hooked up right, Rob. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, and then, and I guess a way to think of it is if you plopped a kick drum down in the, you know, where your computer is in between your speakers and somebody hit the kick drum, that, that head is probably coming towards you first mm-hmm. when they hit the beat or just like, and yeah. so you, why not uh, emulate that with the speaker itself? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So once you've once you've got that correct, then it's uh, it's check it going through and checking phase. And like I said, just what does it sound like? Does it sound better or does it sound worse? Is it good? Now, do you do you find this is useful on other instruments like the bass guitar or even on a vocal? Yes, yeah, bass bass guitar. Um, to be honest, with vocal, I've never, I've not even tried it. Um, I can't think of a, a time when I would have had been provided with two microphones from the same vocal. Um, I have, I have heard people in the past talk about absolute phase of something. So if you just have one mic on the vocal, you can still switch the polarity. And I think it, initially we're going to likely go, well, they sound the same. Mm. But um, but I've heard people suggest that if you f- invert the polarity of a vocal mic, uh, it can actually make the vocal sit different in a mix. And mm-hmm. I, I haven't really explored that much myself, but uh, I probably need to do yes. more of that. Yeah, Certainly worth inter- exploring. Yeah, it's interesting. I- I've never. Even... You got nothing better to do with your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the middle of mix prepping yeah. for if you're six looking hours. for ways to never turn in this mix, yeah. the final mix, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, I would check, uh, uh, check the bass, um, as well. It, with phase, it, the most important, the, the thing with phase, if it's wrong, you've lost the bottom end. The, it just sounds hollow 
and you're fighting it then with EQ, you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're sitting there and you, well, why, why, why isn't my kick drum hitting hard? Like I, what's going on? You know, why can't I hear the bass? Why is the bass coming and going? Why, why can I, can I hear it in, you know, the last chorus and, or why can I hear some notes and can't hear other notes? So, yeah. um, it's, it's well worth spending some time reading a few books or, you know, books <laughs> or go on the internet <laughs> Uh, go on the internet, watch some YouTube. Careful with YouTube videos because sometimes it's not always true what they say. Right. So right. go to a reliable source and and really fathom out um, phase and how it works and what you're doing and what the phase button is and what it does. And you can just save yourself so much heartache and anguish trying to work out, you know, and fix things in the mix. Um, yeah. with an AQ plugin. Well, I have more questions about mixing, if you don't mind. Um, sure. One of the other tracks you sent was um, The Funeral mm. um, by, uh, how do I say it, R.G. Manuel Pilia and Ben Moore. Oh, um, yes. I don't, know if, I don't know if I pronounced that right. But <laughs> this, was a, this was like a dry spoken word vocal over mm. the top of music, and it made me think about dry vocals. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk about how often you feel like it's useful to have a dry vocal in music or, or, you know, maybe the, the other part aspect of the question is how often when we hear a dry vocal, is it not really dry, but there's actually some clever, clever short delays mm. or ambience added to it, that kind of thing. Mm. Do you want to just talk about making vocals sit right in a mix? Yeah, certainly. That was a um, a specific requirement from the um, artist on that. He specified he wanted a dry vocal. Now, uh, what it isn't actually dry. There is a very, very short, short reverb on it. Um, I'm so smart. <laughs> <laughs> so because dry is dry, man, it's just, <laughs> oh. And so what I wanted to do was just, okay, compromise a little bit and I'll give him I'll give him the sound of a small room, <laughs> you know, like an office or yeah. something. Or it's got a very, I can't even remember the, the, the length of reverb I used on it now, but um, um, I know it was, an, it was an EMT 250, I think I used. Uh, oh, okay, cool. And yeah, the R2D2 of plate yeah, reverbs. Yeah. And we had one of those at the BBC as well. It was fantastic. Yeah. And really got really warm. <laughs> which was nice in the winter, but anyway. Oh, nice. It's like, it looks like a radiator too. Yeah. Actually. It doesn't really look like R2-D2, but for some reason that makes me think of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did use a, a very short reverb on it to give it, to, to help it sit, because the rest of the, the, the track um, has um, got, it, the track is quite cinematic in places. So I think a drive vocal absolutely bone dry vocal would have would jarred against that and so that's uh, that's what we ended up doing but it's all about mood um and depth with with reverb and um the modern tier I, I think i i don't tend to use a lot of i always try to use as little as much as i can no as little as i can get away with with when it comes mm -hmm. to reverb because i think that gives away an amateurish sounding mix um, unless it's a sp specific requirement from the artist where they've said, I want lashings of reverb, then, then that's what we go for. If that's what they want to create this dreamy soundscape um, for the verses, for example, then, then that's what I'll provide. I'll do that. But if I'm just being asked to mix a straight up rock, uh, a rock or indie track that's, you know, really going for it, then I will use the minimal amount of reverb as I can and and I'll use um delay, slap delay really to 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 give it a little bit more kind of length. Yeah. Yeah, it's um slap delay does some interesting things. I guess you make a good point. It gives the word the tone and the words a little bit more length. Mm -mm. It can also make it sound like it's sitting back in the mix a little mm -hmm. bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, it can also just make it sound just not plain. Yeah. You know, that might be kind of extreme. 
Um, and then I guess it also just sort of has a little bit of a doubling effect as well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, it, it's great. I, I love playing with reverbs and delays, uh, but I feel as though I've got so much to learn um, that it's just a never ending. You can do so much and be so creative with them uh, yeah. that it, it's a color palette you've got that that can keep you entertained for hours. But you've got to yeah, get that. Or- You've got to get that mix finished, though, you know? Yeah. Or, or maybe the producer could have made some of those decisions at the recording stage. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been nice. Yeah. You know, and that's why, again, bringing back Sylvia Massey, uh, the concept of getting creative with the sound as it gets captured is, you know, potentially going to make, you know, a thousand decisions for you that you don't have to make at the mix. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And the, the fewer decisions you have, the more you can just go with the flow of the music and just move with the music and move faders as if you were part of the music yourself, as if you were an instrument, yeah. you know? So. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, um, we're, we are going for a good long stretch here. Um, there is another question that, that kind of goes into the jam session question when I talk about the business side of stuff, but, um, I noticed that you have a great website. Oh, thank you. It's new. And, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I guess thank you for thanking me for my question. But um, talk about uh, the importance of a website, and you know, is there sort of a logic to way to the way that you created yours? Um, mm. You know, what are what are the thoughts that went into creating your new website mm. that you're you know that you intend to function well for you for your business? Yeah, I I spent a lot of time researching what goes into a good website and what goes into a a website that converts for you. So, i.e. get people to click on whatever it is you want them to click on. Um, That's that's what converts means. Yes. So I felt that it was important that people... I put myself in the shoes of of my of my clients and thought, okay, what am I going? What am I looking for? I want a mixing engineer. Um, and the first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to hear what I can do. Mm-hmm. So that was why the pretty much the first thing that, apart from an introduction, a short introduction, the first thing they scroll down to is an example. Um, of a before and exam, um, sorry, a before and after example of what it is I can do to your mix. So um, I placed emphasis on on that above all else, really, which was um, to give my client the first opportunity to listen to what I can do. And the before is just a rough mix of a client, um, and the after is is obviously my mix. What if my player is before and I'm still working on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, then, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's a challenge. But <laughs> I'm uh, just kidding around. Sorry, yeah. I have a bad, bad habit of doing that. <laughs> um, so, okay, so before and after player, I think that's super smart. And it's super smart that you talk about really thinking through, like, when somebody comes to your website, like, why are they there? What are they, what is, what's the whole point of them being there and what do you want them to do next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. You know, they're there because they're looking for a mixing engineer or a mastering mastering engineer. They're going to, first thing I want to know is what do they sound like? Second thing is how much do they cost? Probably. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, prominently on my website, I've got um, the, a button for people to request a quote from me to find out, you know, how much their particular project's going to cost, which I can, I can quote once I know a bit more about the project um, and uh, what's, what's going to be involved. Can you talk about, um, not, not to dig into your rates, but can you talk about the thinking process that would help the rock stars answer that question for themselves? Um, What, what sort of stuff comes through, the request that mm. um, they might need to consider, and then how can they distill that into okay, this this is the rate I might turn mm. on and offer somebody. Yeah, I mean, I 
I leave it kind of open for my uh, customers to fill in a box basically and leave it up to them. At some um, contact forms can be quite lengthy and a bit of a pain in the arse basically to for, to ask people to fill out. So yes. I, I try to keep it really simple and um, um, just ask people to expand on the project. Tell me what it's about and. By the way, did you pronounce that? Did you pronounce that properly? Should it be pain in the arse? Arse with an R, yes. With an R, okay, it was. Okay, I was just, yeah. sorry. I, yeah. I was corrected by our good friend Ian Shepard recently <laughs> for that. So I just want to make sure I was, I was keeping us true to form. <laughs> uh, yeah, why? What did you say? Were you saying ass? Yeah, I think I might have. I think I might have. No. I forgot the R. Yeah, no, you're wrong, you see. Yeah, so it's pain in the arse and... So I asked for, I asked for it in their own words, basically. So, uh, you know, how many tracks approximately per record, per uh, song? Um, what sort of genre is it? Um, and uh, I also ask for an idea on their budget just so that I can, um, I can try and work towards um, a budget that might not be quite in the right ballpark, but at least I can offer something. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, when you're coming up with, with rates, it's, it's quite, it's quite, it can be quite tricky. I, what I've ended up doing is I now track my time. So I have a, a um, a free, there's a free app that I use. Um, and I just record the time I spend mixing a song, prepping a song, doing the revisions and uh, preparing the versions. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, um, you know, by the end of um, another 12 months, I don't know, by the end of a a length of time, I will be able to get a reasonably accurate average of how long it takes me to do those elements. Yeah. And what then, is that? What, what's the app? Is that something that you can share with us? Yeah, it's called uh, Clockify. Good name. Yeah, Clockify, and it's free, and it would, um, it's, comes with a little app that sits in the menu bar, um, or you can use it from uh, Google Chrome with a with a extension, um, and you can set up projects, set up tasks within projects. Um, you can set up um, estimated time, so you can you can say, okay, I think it's going to take me six hours to do mix prep. And then it will um, sort of give you a warning if you're going over that time. I'll stress you out. Yeah. <laughs> quickly, quickly. It'll look at you funny. <laughs> um, well, um, that's great. Great, great tip for that. Thank you. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a pretty cool app. And you can put in um, your, your billing rate as well. So you can see if what you're charging is actually accurate for the time you're spending on the yeah, that's good app. advice. And, and I think a, a good takeaway from this is reminding us that um, we do have to, you know, we do have to create a mirror for ourselves and and go through the effort of measuring and understanding our, ourself and our own process. And it takes a minute, you know, it, it doesn't have to take forever. You just need to start sooner mm -hmm. rather than later as far as Mm -hmm. you know, training yourself to turn the clock on and measure it and stuff like that. And I think another takeaway is that like, it's okay to get it wrong in the meantime. Yeah. You know, just uh, blame yourself for, for g charging too little at first and yeah. uh, you know, don't go around blaming everybody else. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, the focus has got to be on the mix, you know, send out the best mix you can possibly do. And if it takes you, you know, eight hours, or if it takes you three days, just send the best mix you can send. Um, and then you can work on the rest later, you know, the yeah, yeah. getting your out time averages and, and, and all that later. Just get the best mix done and out that you can possibly do. You know, uh, this is, the thought is popping in my head. There's one client that is going to be recurring 100% in your career, and that's you. So <laughs> you're the one who's going to show up for the next mix and the mix after that and the mix after that. And that's the one, that's the person that you can work with to really hone in and dial and, and streamline the process and get it better and better. 
Whereas the the actual artists that you're mixing for, they may send you multiple mixes. They might come back for other records, but it might, it might also be another year or two from now before they come back again. And so, uh, you know, with that in mind, they might not be the right person to try and, mm -hmm. you know, fine tune. Yeah. yeah. It's really, you got to, you can fine tune yourself. Yes. Yes. Wasn't that just a lovely bit of wisdom? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah, uh, we are coming to the end of the interview. I hate to say it um, oh. because I could just keep talking to you for ages, ages upon Yonks. ages. Yonks, as I, we say. For yonks. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow one of your terms. I could just, I could offer you a lashing of questions. <laughs> I think that's how you use the term a little while ago with reverb. Lashings of reverb, yeah. Lashings of reverb, yeah. I've got <laughs> lashings of questions here. <laughs> Um, but let me take you to the uh, to the end and 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 just sort of hit you with a few of the quick questions. Um, what what other advice do you have for the rock stars about the business side of doing this? Uh, is there any encouragement or um, you know just a bit of advice you want to share with them if they want to do this for more than just a hobby? Um, yeah, I I would say um, stop. Start small. If you, if you if it's a hobby now and you think you might be able to make something of it, don't give up your day job. Um, start Especially if you're brewing beer. Come on. It's <laughs> yes. a great day job. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? Um, don't give up your day job. Do, do what you can on the side in the evenings. Get up early in the morning. You know, make time. Uh, don't waste time. Don't do an extra hour on the Xbox, you know, just put that time, be serious, be um, intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Put some time aside and mix as often as possible. And then as far as the business is concerned, um, maybe you could try doing some stuff for your friends, free maybe. Um, just so that you can build up your portfolio. But then once you've got, you know, uh, three, five songs, start charging. Um, yeah, well, you you know, you're just based on your own description of your website, you've got two, uh, two things you can knock out right off the bat just by doing a bunch of free work for somebody. You can find out, you can, you can build and create a before and after player. Mm-hmm. And you can find out, you can measure your time and find out um, what you should be budgeting, uh, you know, for time based on numbers of tracks and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's not, it's not really free. Again, you're your own client. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so, you know, um, put the time in, put the effort in, be serious about it, be intentional about it. And, um, you know... If it was meant to be, it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So now how about an organizational um, tip or an online resource, something that you use to keep all your shit together and stay yeah. organized? Yeah. I uh, use uh, Asana, which is a project management tool that, again, is free. Uh, it does have a paid plan, but uh, but we don't need it. Um, the, the paid plan is more for teams. So it's just a... a, a um, to-do list manager, project manager, um, and I use it uh, all the time. I use it every day to plan my day. Uh, to uh, even if I have just a random thought about thing, something I might want to do for the business, um, you know, or or an idea for a blog post, I'll just put it in Asana as a task, and then you can sort uh, your tasks into projects. And listen, listen to you just dropping an, an idea for a blog post in there. I didn't even know you were blogging. That's awesome. Yeah, I've, I've started a blog. So um, I, it's really hard for me at the moment to actually sit down and write blog posts. Yeah. Um, but um, I need to be a bit more disciplined about it. Uh, I've got loads of stuff to write about. I just need to um, carve out the time and make it a regular thing. Uh, it's something I intend yeah. to do every week, once a week, is to write a blog post. Because it's good for the website. It's good for SEO, which is your search engine optimization, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Google likes that sort of thing. So yeah. uh, 
Uh, so if, it, Lord knows we got to do whatever Google wants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, awesome. And then uh, uh, I also use Asana. I think oh, it's great. Um, in fact, w- as soon as we finish this, all my notes about this this interview will go straight into an Asana task oh, okay. on there. Um, I use um, I use it for client revisions as well. Yeah, so I I want to dig in a little bit deeper with you there. So you talked about planning out your day and then the client revisions. Can you break that down just a little bit more for us? Yeah. Um, so um, I will have I have got very quite a number of projects. Um, some of which are client projects, and some of them are business projects. Things that I want to do for the business. Um, things I I want to explore and might work for me, might not. So I set up all d- separate projects for those. Um, and uh, I, and I sit and I think about what it is I want to accomplish from those projects and come up with a, a bunch of tasks. Then I'll give them where I feel necessary. I'll give them due dates. And then they, uh, it's great. It sounds great because if you give something a due date, even if it's six months in the future, it will uh, drop that task into your daily task list um, once it becomes due, which is great. Um, mm-hmm. But then for client revisions, I've gone through various ways to to try and get on top of client revisions um, because I think it must be so frustrating, the, the most frustrating part for an online mixing and mastering business from a client perspective is toing and froing on blooming email about what they want, the changes they want in the mix. Yeah, or or a message. And yeah. I just went through that experience on the on the client end. So I, I had a project oh. and I passed it on to a friend and he started to mix it. And immediately I had that sense of like the boat is leaving the dock without me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. It's um it, it's so frustrating. Um for the clients, I'm sure. And, you know, I, at the moment, um, what I do is, uh, I'll send a mix, a mix out. I'll give it, I'll send it with a email and give the client an example of how I'd like the revisions to come back, um, grouped, um, you know, the drums under one group and the guitars under another group, et cetera, et cetera, with timestamps. So where they are in the track, um, and that seems to be the tried and trusted way that it, that that most people use. Um, but what I've found is that um, with Asana, you can forward your client's email that's got all the revisions in it. You can forward it to your Asana inbox and then mm. you can assign it to the project. And I edit the uh, email once it uh, once it hits my Asana. Um, inbox I edit it and then I pick out all the bits that they want changing and I um, change them into subtasks um, oh, that's br- brilliant so instead of trying to here's here's a great takeaway for me from that instead of trying to again train your client to adopt a whole new system of communicating mm-hmm. when they're only going to be here today and then maybe two years from now you you let them communicate with you in a simple way that they're familiar with, like email, uh-huh. but you make your system convert that into something that's useful for you. Yes, yes. And then I work through the revisions and I and I check them off, um, the sub uh, subtasks off in Asana. And then you can actually print that off in Asana. Or you and I what I do is I print it as a PDF. And I send it along with my revised mix to the client and the client can open that PDF up and they can see their email. They can see the parts I've taken out of their email. They can see that I've completed them and they can then also see any comments I've ha- I have about a particular revision that I think might not work or I tried it and it didn't work or, um, oh, I, by the way, I heard this, so I've changed this as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, that's brilliant. And it's just in a simple PDF document attached to the email that's got the new revision um, mix on it. That's cool. When you say print it off, it reminded me that I actually like to physically print out 
<clears throat> the mixed notes and have them just sitting with me on the desk. And then with a mm. the pencil, I'll just check things off and cross them out. Yeah. Because it kind of help, helps me. Um, and then also, it just helps me avoid having to share the screen, you know, between a, a Chrome browser and Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's Not that I, that's all that hard to do. No, I, I've got the two screens, so that's how I, I can accomplish it, really. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well... Um, this is awesome stuff, Sarah. Uh, I, I bet I got like two more hours of questions for you. <laughs> so to me, that means that we'll just have to do another podcast episode at some point. <laughs> sure, I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Just awesome, awesome stuff you talked about. Um, I'm so super impressed with you and your work and um, this great story of, you know, really advancing in something, then deciding I'm ready to try something else, advancing in that, saying I'm ready to try something else and advancing in that. Yeah. Um, how can the rock stars find you online, follow you, keep up with you? Uh, if they're looking to, you know, have an amazing next mix, how do they reach out to you and, and uh, get in touch with you? Yeah. Yeah. They can uh, find me on the internet. My, uh, the web address is uh, musicmixpro.co.uk. Um, and certainly, uh, have, uh, welcome to take a look at the website. Um, I'm happy for you to contact me and tell me what you think of the, uh, of the website and what you think, if there's anything missing or anything I should change or anything that would work better. I'd love to know. Lo love feedback. Love feedback. Um, and then I frequent, uh, Instagram, which, um, I think I'm Sarah Mix Master Music on there. But uh, the, then I'll go on to Facebook as well. Uh, occasionally you'll find me on Twitter. But I'm sure you will find um, all the relevant links below in the show notes, as they say. Yeah. I find that Instagram is a really good tool for a lot of um, studios and producers mm. and artists these days. It seems that uh, it, that... Instagram is a great way to just, you know, shoot a little video of your screen while you're working on a mix. And yeah. it does give you this little brief, you know, photo image or video insight into people's worlds, which is a pretty fun way to share music. Yeah. Plus, have you noticed that Instagram has a pretty good sound? Oh. Um, it, it makes everything sound really loud and like super mastered. You know, if you just, if you shoot a video of your screen playing a clip of music, it, yeah. it tends to... Come oh. out slamming. <laughs> <laughs> I bet uh, Mr. Ian Shepard would have something to say about that. Yeah, he would. He would. <laughs> but we uh, we um, politely uh, butt heads on all kinds of things <laughs> in, a, in a helpful way. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show. I can't wait to meet you in person. I don't know when I'm coming to um, to England, but I know it's it's due. Oh, cool. Uh, May, I may need to come there for an AES conference or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, 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 that'd be when, great. When do? What time of year do you guys have your your big um, recording and you know pro audio conferences and things like uh, that? We're not as blessed as you are. Um, I'd love to come to Nam, but um, it's a, such a long way for a north. <laughs> it really is for a northern girl. But uh, yeah, no, one day I will come to Nam. But in the UK, there, there's nothing really as uh, comprehensive um, as NAM, but the AES, uh, we had a mastering conference. The AES had a mastering conference here last year, um, but I don't know of any dates coming up, um, of any big events anyway. All right, all right. Well, and I know that they're sort of like scattered across Europe too. There will be AES yeah. conferences and things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to put this out there, but come on, BBC, how about you guys create the next big conference? I mean, yeah. the UK, you guys have been famous for having the biggest music festivals in the world, some of them. So maybe you could, uh, maybe you could yeah. start having some big pro audio festivals. <laughs> you never know. You never know. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us and I guess we'll see you around the studio. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for having All me. Right. All right. Cheers. Bye. 
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music